Hello, and welcome to This Might Be a Stupid Question, the show where I rant about questions that are on students' minds, questions that most would feel too embarrassed to ask. Our question for today, how many hours should I be studying? I have mixed feelings about this question. On the one hand, I'm glad when I hear it because it shows that the student actually cares. On the other hand, it reminds me of how badly our broken education system has warped our perception of how learning actually works. I don't have a straight answer for this question because the question is wrong. The question assumes something overly simplistic about learning that time spent studying leads to learning and therefore more time spent studying leads to more learning. The reason you're not doing well in a certain class, presumably, is because you've been studying for one hour a day when it should be two. So you start studying for two hours a day and there's not much of an improvement. Then maybe you start doing three hours a day, and after you see that it's still not helping and you've become sufficiently stressed out, you end up wondering if there's something wrong with you. So you ask your teacher or tutor how long you should be studying. If they say something like five hours a day, you feel overwhelmed. If they say something like two hours a day, you feel stupid. No matter the answer, you're not going to like it. That's because you're not looking at the real problem. And the reason you're not looking at the real problem is because you were taught to look at something else. You should be looking at specific study goals, which I will talk about in more detail later. But instead, you're taught to look at study time and only study time. Where did this come from? Well, it turns out that people who really want to understand something they care about will naturally spend a lot of time on it. Think about something that you're kind of an expert on, at least when compared to people your, people your age, and think about how much time you've naturally put into it because you find it fascinating and you really want to know about it. It doesn't even have to be academic in nature. I'll give some personal examples. I have a fascination with how people's brains work. It's been something I've always been curious about ever since I was a kid. At first, I didn't even know psychology existed, so I would observe people around me and also think about quotes and proverbs that talked about human nature. It was automatic. I didn't have to plan ahead and set aside time for it, I just did it. If someone shouted at another person, I wanted to know why, and I'd think about why they did it for five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever amount of time I had for that given day. I eventually got to the point where I even started observing myself. Then I started reading books and articles and thinking about the stuff I was reading. It's quite the experience, especially when you read something and have that moment of realization where you go, oh wow, I already figured this out on my own, but now I have confirmation, I totally called it. If I had to take a test on my knowledge of psychology, I'd probably do pretty well and without having to do any review. Another example is technology. In a group, I always get relegated to the dreadful tech support role because nobody else knows how to do basic troubleshooting. I will probably record a separate rant about that topic alone someday. Anyway, where did my general tech savviness come from? I just wanted to know what all the buttons did. Click this button or that button, see what it does, maybe look it up online if I still couldn't tell what it was doing. Then think of scenarios where I could make use of it. Rinse and repeat like that until I became a sort of expert. Notice I've been saying expert and not master. That will be important later. One more example, video games. When it comes to platformers, I've come to notice that while not a master, I have become better than the average player. At first, I just played them for fun, but then I discovered videos on YouTube where people would do these perfect runs of a level or boss battle that gave me a hard time, and I realized there was a technique to it. 
I started looking for enemy patterns that I could predict and take advantage of. Then I would spend time trying to focus on defense only until I'd get pretty good at dodging attacks before finally adding on my offensive strategy. Sometimes I can win without taking any hits, but even if that doesn't happen, the results are still quite satisfying. What each of those three examples have in common is the reason I spent so much time on them. I had a goal in mind, a certain level of performance that I wanted to reach. I kept putting time into them until I reached a level that I was happy with. I didn't start by saying, I plan to practice this for 100 hours. It just turned out that way. If you set the goal as practicing for 100 hours, what you'll probably end up doing is find the easiest thing you can do so that you can get to 100 hours painlessly. It's the same thing that happens when your English teacher tells you to write a 1,000 word essay. You write about 800 words, and then you add about 200 words of filler. Maybe you don't even do it intentionally, but your brain will steer you towards easier ways to reach your goal. This is why it's important to have the right goal in mind while studying. With the right goal, your brain will keep nagging you until you've actually reached it. Or at least until you think you've reached it. There's another thing you need to have after setting the right study goal if you want to find success, and that's timely, accurate feedback. One thing you'll probably hear me emphasize over and over again in my videos is the importance of being able to self-assess. Some people will consider that an ideal rather than a necessity, but I'll talk about my stance on that some other day. If you don't know how to evaluate your own performance, you're going to need someone else, or something else, to help you figure out how you're doing. This can be your teacher, assuming they are 1. competent and 2. not like Dr. Thorne. See one of the previous videos for reference, link in the description probably. If not your teacher, it can also be something like the answers in the back of the book, a solution manual, your score on a Quizlet, or even your grade, but it's important to keep in mind that they all depend on how well you trust the accuracy of the scoring process. Solution manuals and answer keys can sometimes be wrong, and if you find a random quiz on the internet and you have no clue who made it, you could easily get lost. If you don't have a detailed breakdown of which points you lost and why you lost them, your grades won't be much help. The bottom line is make sure you have a source of feedback and one that you can trust. So now it's time to talk about setting the right study goals. This ultimately depends on what you want. In the amount of time that's available to a busy student, mastery is probably too tall of an order, but competence is well within reach for most people if they want it badly enough. In case you were wondering what I mean by competence here, basically, I mean having a strong sense of knowing what you're doing, being able to tell that you've learned a skill and knowing that you can prove it at least to yourself, especially to yourself, and eventually to others. So if we're setting competence as a goal, what does that look like? I'll give an example. Say you've just learned about linear equations and you know you're struggling. A chapter test is coming up in about a week. Your study goal is not study linear equations for six hours. Your goal is study until I can, one, look at a graph and write the equation, get it done in about a minute or less without rushing, get rid of or reduce unnecessary pauses, and make mistakes less than 5% of the time. Two look at an equation and be able to draw the graph in about a minute or less without rushing, etc. You've heard it all before. Three, be able to look at a table of values and be able to tell if their relationship is linear. Four, be able to read a word problem and figure out what needs to be done without having to read it more than three times. Notice how those four items I listed are both specific and measurable. You first want to be able to do it, but competence is more than just being able to do it. You want to be able to do it well. 
Once you're able to do it, you then want to be able to do it without making mistakes. Then you want to be able to do it in a reasonable amount of time. No rushing. That just leads to more mistakes and defeats the whole purpose. I always tell my students that accuracy comes before speed. Anyway, that list could go on, but I hope I've illustrated the point. Maybe the first two items on that list take 10 minutes each, and maybe the fourth one takes two hours alone. But the focus is on getting the right results and not on how much time it takes to get them. Maybe it'll turn out to be six hours. Maybe it won't. All that matters is reaching the desired level of competence. So that's the goal. What's the strategy? Deliberate practice. I will leave a link in the description to a resource that explains it in some detail, but I'll give you the gist of it here. Basically, the strategy is to break everything down into sub-problems and focus on the parts that you aren't handling too well. If steps 1, 2, and 5 out of 5 are easy for you, then don't practice those steps. Practice steps 3 and 4. Continuing with our linear equations example, maybe you already know how to write the equation when you're given a point in a slope. If that's the case, practice time spent on writing the final equation is probably a waste of your time. You already know how to do that after all, so there's not much to be gained from spending time on it. Instead, you might want to practice finding the slope when it's not given. Focus on just that one part. Do not solve the whole problem. Practice it with whole numbers first. Once you've got the hang of it, try it with decimals and fractions. Once you've reached a point where you can do it without thinking too hard about it, once you can do it almost on autopilot, as I like to say, move on to some other part. If you find that you're still not getting the hang of it, break it down even further. Figure out the smallest thing you're getting wrong and ignore everything else until you can get that part right. Then you can worry about putting it together with everything else. Are you struggling to calculate slope because you keep getting your x's and y's mixed up? Then forget about the slope formula for a while and spend a few minutes coming up with a way to remember which is which when reading coordinates. It'll probably take you five minutes to realize that you can just remember that x comes before y alphabetically. Then take another two minutes making up some random points and reading off the x and y values from them just to train your brain to read it off quickly and make the process feel more automatic. Just like that, in under 10 minutes, you will have eliminated something that was slowing down the whole problem for you. A step that was taking you two whole minutes is now getting done in under 20 seconds. You've just saved yourself an extra minute and a half every time you do a full problem. And with no rushing needed. That's how it's done. Just like a jigsaw puzzle, you should work on the border pieces first, and then everything else will start falling into place. So that takes care of the core of what I wanted to talk about, but there is one more thing I'd like to address. What counts as studying? I think there's a certain image that comes to people's minds when they hear the word study. A person sitting at a desk, staring at a book, maybe with a pencil in hand. Some studying does look like that, but what about other forms of study? You might remember some of the personal examples I gave toward the beginning of this talk. You may recall that the first one, about how I learned a lot of psychology, involved a lot of thinking and observing. Thinking and observing. Thinking and observing. There's a lot to be gained from just thinking about things, and I don't see anybody advocating for that approach, which is a shame. If you're sitting there thinking that this only applies to psychology, think again. It's also a big part of the reason I was able to reach my current level in math and physics. I believe I was in second grade when I first thought of what happens if you subtract a big number from a small number, like 3 minus 5. 3 minus 5. What's 3 minus 5? After dwelling on it for a while and thinking about it in terms of years, apples, dollars, and so on, I was left with the belief that it should be called minus 2. 
A few years later, I would learn the concept of negative numbers, and my teacher would describe me as a quote-unquote fast learner. But in reality, I didn't learn fast. I learned ahead. And I learned ahead because I dared to be curious and try to figure things out for myself, rather than wait for a teacher to tell me how to do it. When the teacher finally covered it, I didn't have to take their word for it. I believed it because I tested it out in my head and saw that it made sense. Now how about an example from physics? I was in high school at the time. After learning about center of mass for the first time, I was obsessed with finding a way to make an educated guess about where it would be for weirdly shaped objects. For those who are already feeling lost, the center of mass of an object is basically its balancing point. If you have something like a ruler or a small plank of wood, you know that you can balance it on the tip of your finger if you put your finger right under the middle of it. What if one side of it was made of wood and the other side was made of metal? Well, then you couldn't balance it at the middle. The heavy side would tip over. So to find the balancing point, you would have to try someplace closer to the heavy side. What if it was all made of wood, but it didn't have the shape of a rectangle? What if it was shaped like a half circle? If it was a full circle, a full disk of wood, you'd obviously just balance it at the middle. But what about a half circle? What about a quarter circle? Is the balancing point even on the object? If it's a ring of wood, you'd expect the balancing point to be in the middle, but you can't touch it there. So is there some other way you could tell for sure? Maybe if you throw it. There is a way to figure this out with math, and I could find that in the textbook. But my questions about center of mass were posed with the goal of understanding center of mass, figuring out how I could feel my way through it, so to speak. The book doesn't really give you that. You can stare at it all you want, but until you spend a decent amount of time playing around with the idea in your head, observing objects in real life, and thinking about what you're observing, you won't learn how to guess where the center of mass is. You won't train your brain to estimate center of mass on autopilot for you. You'll memorize the steps to do it with math, but if you make a mistake, you won't notice that something is off, because you wouldn't have a clue where to expect that balancing point to be. Technically, it's not something you'll likely be tested on, but it's still worth studying because it improves your accuracy by helping you catch mistakes. I could carry on with more examples like this, but I think I've given you enough to get the basic idea of studying by thinking and observing. Feeling the physics when you open a door, noticing the math when you buy and sell things, wondering about the chemistry and biology of baking bread, because you still haven't figured out how to bake the perfect cheese roll and you should probably just suck it up and buy proper measuring equipment like a normal person, but you don't want to because you don't bake that often and it would feel like a waste to buy all that equipment just to have it sitting in a cupboard and not get a whole lot of use. No, I don't have a problem. Why would you think that? Okay. I got off track there for a bit, but we're close to the end. One last note on making observations. There are some things you can observe directly in the physical world. Some things you won't have the right equipment or resources for, but fortunately, you can usually find videos or illustrations online to help with that. For the more abstract ideas that don't exist in the physical world, you can do some experiments in your head or on paper, such as my earlier example of what happens when you try three minus five, and make observations from that. Abstract or not, you just need to let your curiosity guide you. Ask why. Ask how. Ask what if. Go down that rabbit hole and see what you can find. Or don't. I can't make you do it if you don't want to. All I can do is tell you what worked for me, and I think I've done enough of that for one video, so I'll wrap things up here. I hope this has been helpful. This has been Al the Tutor reminding you once again that ignorance is not bliss. Take care, and I will see you in the next video.